All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, I want to start by making a promise. Uh, and here it is. Uh, by the end of this program, you will have learned a few skills to help make your bird watching opportunities more fun, more impactful, and more inclusive. Our measure of success will hopefully be judged as early as tomorrow when you make your note of your first bird of the day. Because uh, once you step outside, birds are going to be a constant and ever-present reason to find joy and lifelong learning. If you, uh, you, if you could grab, a, if you want to, grab a few pieces of paper and pencil, because there could be some things for you to participate in as we go. All right. I do want to start out uh, to, with a shout out to our collective members of our three kindred organizations. And we recognize we're not alone as we share values. Holly Hill Farms, the Trustees of the Reservation, Wildlands Trust, the Jones and Weir River Watershed Associations, and our own town's open space conservation and community preservation committees, to name just a few all work tirelessly and against all odds to steward our precious and diminishing natural history heritage. I wanna focus on our three hosts for a minute. Collectively, these three organizations have been, uh, oops, sorry, we'll go back to that one. Uh, been around for three, 365, no, sorry, 265 years uh, serving our communities. And uh, just as you look at our mission statements, you'll see a lot of uh, parallels between the three organizations. And um, just uh, the success of, of the health of our communities really has uh, been directly linked to these three organizations. And we know everyone uh, is limited, has limited funds and, and we know people have choices as to where they contribute their, their time, money and volunteer work. Uh, but I, I will throw out this gentle uh, challenge. If, if you are not a member of all three organizations, uh, please consider it. Um, we all do uh, wonderful work and we all approach it a little differently. So it's uh, very impactful if we can uh, strengthen our membership. Thank you. So here's tonight's agenda. Uh, we'll, we're gonna kind of rip through this because we've got a lot of information to cover. Uh, so, Let's start off with, you know, why bird? Why is it so Im uh, impressive? The, the numbers of people that are joining this uh, hobby, if you will, is, is pretty remarkable. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we're gonna do a shallow dive into what makes a bird. And we're gonna all surprise ourselves just how much we already know about birds. Uh, and then we're gonna kind of switch gears and talk about all of the tools that are available to us uh, as we get out and uh, go out and bird watch, essentially. And so we're gonna go through guidebooks, we're gonna talk a little bit about optics, um, then online resources and apps, which uh, are amazing these days. And then a little bit about where you can get support uh, through networking. So you might be familiar with this bird. You probably see it come through your yard once in a while, especially if you feed, feed birds. And this is a Cooper's hawk and uh, it's an occipiter, uh, which means it's one of the, the hawks that takes birds on the wing. Uh, not that it wouldn't grab one off of your feeder, but they are adept at, at uh, taking other birds right as they fly. Uh, and so 
you will see later on how that connects to some of our other birds. So let's continue. So why bird? Well, statistics are, are a big way to understand why you, we should bird because it's so popular. I mean, there's 20% of US citizens consider themselves birders and that works out to be 60 million birders. Uh, and benefits, of course, are um, there's a wealth of information about birds. You never run out of, uh, of things to learn. Any time of the year, birding is an, is an excuse to get outside for a walk. Uh, understanding habitats and connections, essentially birds are canaries in a coal mine, giving us real-time information on the health of our planet, including insight on their migratory destinations. And birding's uh, appeal is universal and a great way to meet new, new folks. Uh, and it crosses, crosses generations for sure. It's also, um, there's a continuum for bird watching. You don't have to be anywhere along this continuum in order to appreciate birds for what they are. Uh, you can take it as, uh, as well, as, as serious as you want. So one of the things uh, to think about uh, is that, it, yeah, again, it can be enjoyed by any age, at any skill level, anywhere. And it, it can be simply an interest in the, in the birds in your backyard. Uh, perhaps you have a pair of robins that make a nest every year uh, right outside your front door. Or maybe you go for walks specifically looking for birds, or you keep a list, or you might even have a bird feeder set up, uh, or you can travel to specific hotspots in pursuit of a trophy, like the, uh, the folks in the movie, The Big, the big Year. You can drive pleasure, pleasure anywhere along that continuum. And ultimately, no matter where your interest lies, we're basically all looking at the same bird. So let's start with what we know. So if you have a piece of paper and a pencil, or if you want to write it in the chat, if you have access to chat at this point, write down a dozen birds that you're familiar with. I bet you can come up with even more than that. You're probably aware that uh, populations of birds fluctuate they come and go in numbers. Sometimes you see birds one season and you don't see them the rest of the year. You can probably identify some birds from their calls or their songs. You might be recognized calls, but just don't know which bird they come from. And you also noticed by now that no matter where you are, where you go, there's a bird. So see if this sound sounds familiar to you. This is a white-breasted nuthatch. And what's really fun this winter is there's an awful lot of them around. Uh, and also their cousin, their close cousin, the red-breasted nuthatch is in numbers around here this year that we haven't seen in a long time. And so it's kind of fun to be able to go, go for a walk and see both species of birds and they have two dis distinctive calls. So we're gonna take a shallow dive into what makes a bird. Uh, <clears throat> we all pretty much know that 
it's the only animal with feathers, only living animal with feathers. They have wings, but not all of them fly. You know, penguins have wings and they use their wings for swimming. They have adapted skeletons, which means that many of them, because they fly, their bones are hollow. Some migrate, some of them very, very far, as we'll see in a minute. They're warm blooded. They have the ability to stay warm by many, many ways. They can fluff up their feathers, they can shiver, they can roost together in, in groups. Uh, they're pretty smart. They lay eggs in different styles of nests. Some, some birds build nests, some don't, some uh, use others, other bird species nests. They have beaks and bills, and they have a stunning diversity, uh, which is pretty amazing. If you look at bird populations across the world, uh, starting with the bee hummingbird, the smallest bird in the world, weighs about uh, what a nickel weighs. And in between it and the eight foot ostrich, there's about 9,000 species worldwide. So pretty, import, uh, pretty impressive. Um, this is an amazing photo by Linda Cullivan. This is a pileated woodpecker feeding its young, coming in to feed its young. And um, if you are interested, Linda and Mike, are, her husband, are presenting Arctic wildlife photography this Friday uh, at noon. And if you want to go to our website, Mass Audubon, and look for our online program catalog, you'll see that this is just one of many examples of amazing photographs that they're capable of. All right. We also know that birds eat a variety of food and have specialized beaks that have evolved to serve them well. I suspect that most of us have heard about Darwin's finches from the Galapagos and where he uh, put together his theory on, on evolution. Um, so let's take a real quick look at the bird starting clockwise. Uh, we have a cedar waxwing and it's foraging for fruit. They will also eat insects a lot of the year when they're available, but when they uh, aren't, they'll switch to fruit and we will see cedar wax wings throughout the year. The next uh, bird is a black and white warbler and they feed by gleaning. So they uh, flutter around trees and look underneath leaves and pull up caterpillars and other insects and eat them by kind of just uh, looking for them uh, the term gleaning. We're familiar with seed eaters, like this goldfinch. You see them, if you're feeding birds, you see them often at your feeders, and you can see their bill or beak is designed specifically for breaking uh, open seeds. We have a raptor, and there's our Cooper's hawk again, uh, with, a, with a bill that be, can tear things apart. Below the Cooper's hawk is a white-winged scoter. It's an ocean duck and it dives for fish and its bill is specially designed. Like uh, a red-breasted merganser, it has a little serrations on them to make it easier to grab fish. I bet many of us are familiar with the tree swallow, which is down in the right-hand corner. And it, like flycatchers, uh, the family of flycatchers, uh, catch insects on the wing. And so they're uh, adapted to uh, fly, uh, very, they're very maneuverable and can catch, catch insects as they uh, try to avoid them. We're probably all familiar with the female 
mallard. It's a dabbler, so it, it's a cousin of the diver, of, of the scoter, but it uh, just dabbles. It, it bobs down into the water and feeds on mostly aquatic uh, vegetation, uh, and its bill is designed for that. We'll switch over to the great black back gull. Uh, it shares, like our turkey vulture, they're scavengers. They would rather steal somebody else's food or find food uh, in the form of uh, cadavers. And then we'll finish up with our red knot, which is one of our shorebirds we see uh, in a short window uh, as it comes through to its Arctic uh, nesting grounds. Um, and we're gonna look at that bird in a little more detail right here. We also know birds migrate. And this red knot is one of um, the champions of migration. And as it reads there, it's, it's pretty amazing exactly what they're capable of. Uh, so think of this little bird who weighs just a few grams flying the distance to the moon. Pretty incredible. So what's interesting with this particular species, it will overwinter down at the, uh, Chile, at the very tip of Chile in Argentina, in Tierra del Fuego, and it has to load up on fat and calories before it makes its, its first uh, leg of its journey north, uh, and it'll go all the way to basically the, the Amazon River Delta, where it needs to feed on an entirely different menu before it then has to time the next move so it lands in Delaware Bay and some, somewhere right around here too. Sometimes they'll land in Duxbury Bay, but they time that with the horseshoe crab egg laying uh, so that uh, they feed on horseshoe crab eggs in huge numbers. And they'll stay around a few days and feed up and add uh, half their weight again uh, in protein and fat, and then do the final leg up into the breeding grounds where they raise their young and then turn around and fly all the way back. Some species have adapted to habitats so efficiently that their distribution is impressive. Here, what we know is the great blue heron. Uh, these are photos I've taken uh, in different places. So here's the upper left is a great blue heron in the Florida Everglades. The one sitting on the cactus is in Baja California Sur. And the one on the left in the lower uh, left is right here in Daniel Webster Wildlife Sanctuary. All the same species of bird, but they have, it has learned to adapt to different habitats. So that's the shallow dive. Now let's get into uh, some of the tools available to us when we're birding. So, uh, this is a, a pretty good investment. Uh, if you don't have a bird guide, you could certainly take one out of the library uh, to get started. There's just an amazing assortment of, of uh, options. Uh, kind of the, the, the tried and true one is the Peterson. Um, and there's two versions of it here. Uh, I'm finding, so the one up in the top left, I think is probably uh, about 30, 30 years old, and I keep using it because it fits in a back pocket pretty well. Uh, it's a little dog-eared, uh, and it's actually a little dated, so there's been some changes in species names and, and splits and that kind of thing, but it still serves me well, um, and it's uh, a good, good all-around uh, guidebook. 
what I'm using a lot now is it's a large format edition as my eyesight gets a little less um, uh, reliable. Uh, the, the, the illustrations are much larger and the type is larger, which is great. The uh, Sibley Guide to Birds it came on the, the scene probably 20 years ago now, and uh, it, it came on the scene in a storm. It, uh, David Allen Sibley, just an amazing uh, artist and ornithologist, uh, and put together a number of guidebooks, uh, in, including a, uh, a guide to birding, be, a bird behavior, and now a new book called What's It Like to Be a Bird? And uh, it's incredible. Uh, he, he's also made a more field-friendly size uh, that's akin to the the uh, Peterson that you can. But this the, this one um, is great, but it's pretty heavy. It's maybe not really the best solution for the field. Uh, and these uh, those three use illustrations. And then the National Geographic is an example among others, that um, you uses, and some of them uses photographs uh, instead, and some people prefer that. So how, how one of these works is you open the pages, and I don't know if, if folks were here last week for Dr. Sarah Grady's program, uh, but that is her, uh, one of her favorite birds in the lower left, that's the common eider, and uh, we can look that up in, this is Peterson's, and you can see that there's a number of tools in a guidebook that can be helpful in identifying different species. Um, and among them are uh, field marks, and we'll, we'll go through this more in, in a bit with other slides, but you've got field marks, you've got uh, gender identification, uh, the Plumage of, of pretty much all birds, with some exceptions, are, are very different. Uh, the female uh, is the one that, for the most part, sits on, or gets, gets most of the duty of sitting on the nest, and so it's important that they're camouflaged. And the males use their uh, plumage to try to attract females, so they're, they're, they're pretty distinct. Um, You'll also see uh, information uh, range maps uh, that correspond to the species that lets you know where you're likely to see them at different seasons and whether they migrate or whether they're residents. Um, yeah. What's kind of cool is this uh, upper left-hand bird is another eider that occasionally, it's much less, uh, much rarer, but occasionally you'll see it in a, in a raft of common eiders uh, and often down on the uh, canal. And so you can see in the, in the guidebook, there's an arrow pointing uh, to its feature that, that makes it much different than the common eider. So it's striking. It's not always that bold, but there you have it. So you're gonna find yourself out in the field uh, using these guidebooks and, uh, that talk about field marks. And it would be good to start learning some of the parts of the body of a bird, uh, especially if you're out with some more experienced birders they're gonna be using some of this terminology as they call out field marks that they see uh, that can be helpful in you understanding why this bird is, it, why it is because of its, its field marks. So get familiar with some of these terms uh, and you'll see that also uh, coloration can be tricky in that uh, birds will molt a few times, some, some just once a year, sometimes more than once a year. So you'll also see uh, in guidebooks uh, the differences in those uh, plumages.
Uh, the other thing that's helpful in, in guidebooks, it, it'll give you an indication of how, what the bird's song sounds like or what kind of communication it is uh, famous for. They're not, all, they're not all singing. They can also communicate with calls. But here's one you might have heard, uh, especially they'll, they'll live around here all year long, but uh, you hear them mostly in the spring and summer. Uh, and it sounds, oops. And it sounds like this. Some people think this sounds like tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. And this is the Carolina Wren. Uh, here's a black and white warbler uh, that you have a pretty good chance of seeing as they come through uh, our community as they head to breeding grounds once in the spring and then back through in the fall. Uh, a few might even be present here during the summer because they, they will nest here, some, some of these individuals. Uh, but don't expect you'll identify, uh, let alone see its many warbler relatives that drop in here to refuel uh, in places like Ferry Hill Thicket in, in Marshfield on their way north. Uh, it's, it's a pretty narrow window that we might see these these uh, migrating warblers. And so uh, I wouldn't get hung up if you're starting out, I wouldn't get hung up on, on, uh, on trying to uh, learn all of these right away. Uh, there's a good chance they'll be here in the spring for maybe in a period of a week as they move through. Uh, and then uh, on their way back in the fall, their, their plumage is a lot different not as striking and even harder to identify. Uh, so I wouldn't start with the warbler page um, as, you, as you pick up on some of the birds. So here's, here's some things that we're gonna be looking at when we, when we figure out what bird it is we're looking at. So we're, we wanna be interested in size and shape, the color pattern, its behavior, what is the bird doing? That often is uh, an in, uh, one of the best indicators as to what species we might be looking at. Uh, uh, and, and again, with habitat for the same reasons. The call is gonna really help. The, the field marks, which we talked about, the range maps. And then here's a, a, a tool that I find one of the most important ones in, in the toolbox, and that's patience and humility. Uh, it, it can be, Take some time to see a bird that's flying around and, and camouflaged and hard to, to, it won't settle down. And trying to get binoculars on it or your, or your naked eye on it can be pretty challenging. Um, but this is uh, an American bittern, which we do have in our community. We don't, many, many people don't get to see them very often, but uh, it isn't a songbird uh, but it still communicates. So this is considered a call, not a song. And it sounds to me like, well, there's some frogs, <laughs> but you'll hear this water bubbler sound. And that's the sound it makes. So let's, I'm going to see if I can get, get something blocking my screen. There we go. Uh, let's take a minute to identify this bird on the right. You might already know what it is, um, but let's see if we can classify it by going through a set of, of uh, steps here. So for now, we're going to call it its Latin name, Birdus Unknown to Us. And we're going to look at it in comparison to the size and shape of birds that we're pretty familiar with. And so often we use these as like the, you know, what is the toast, is it bigger than a toaster or smaller than a toaster? 
So these are kind of three standard birds that most people are familiar with that, that are good benchmarks for size and shape. So you can see that uh, the, the L stands for length, the WS stands for a wingspan, and the WT is weight. So if you were to put this Virtus unknown to us into this formula, where would you find it? Where would you fall? Where would it fall in place? So I'm, I'm going to say somewhere in between the robin and the crow. So that's helpful. Uh, we've got an idea of what size it is. Just uh, pretty incredible. <coughs> Excuse me. Birds are uh, weigh a lot less than their mass would would indicate. So this uh, our unknown bird weighs about uh, four and a half pencils, the equivalent of four and a half pencils. So very very light for the size. Now we're going to get into colors and patterns uh, as we look at this bird. So colors and patterns uh, develop through evolution uh, for a variety of reasons. Camouflage being important for both predator and prey uh, is illustrated here with our eastern screech owl hiding in its little cavity. Uh, and the other extreme is like the flamboyant colors and patterns uh, used to attract potential mates, like our uh, unknown bird here. A lot going on with this bird. From color and patterns, we're going to go to behavior. Behavior is going to really uh, help us narrow down uh, what we're looking at because behaviors can be very unique to families of bird. And so this bird undulates when it flies. In other words, it flaps a number of times and then glides. And as it does, it kind of drops uh, down in its flight pattern. And then with a few, a few single wing beats, it gets higher in its flight path and stops flapping and drops again. So it's uh, very indicative to uh, a few families of birds. This bird forages on the ground. It drums on artificial surfaces. It excavates, uh, which means it is uh, a, a cavity builder. So it will um, work on trees and pull, pull things out of trees to make holes. And it perches rather than hitches. And so we're starting to think, many of us are probably thinking, boy, that does kind of look like it could be a woodpecker or in the woodpecker family. It doesn't really look like the ones I'm familiar with, but it has a lot of the traits. And that perches rather than hitches means that it will prefer to sit on a branch than to hitch on the side of a, a tree, uh, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So from behavior, we're going to go to habitat. Uh, where are we going to likely see this bird? And uh, what kind of habitat? And then where in the habitat are we likely to see it? So let's look at uh, Daniel Webster Wildlife Sanctuary as an example and uh, discover some of the uh, various habitats that, that Daniel Webster uh, Wildlife Sanctuary offers. So we've got urban and suburban. So we're, we're basically looking out east uh, to Green Harbor from here. So we're standing, uh, say, in the parking lot of, of uh, Daniel Webster, if you are familiar with it. We're looking straight east. And so as we look north, uh, we're, we're looking downtown and, and along the coast, it would be Brant Rock. Uh, so that's the urban, let me get my pointer here. Oh, let's, let's see if we can get really fancy. Let me know if this gets to be, oh, maybe not. 
I was going to see if I could make a pointer. Uh, but yeah, this, so this is uh, where we're going to likely find our common birds, like the robin that might be nesting in our yard. And we drop down into the riparian area. That's the river, the Green Harbor River. And we're going to have uh, our freshwater ducks. We're going to switch over to grassland where <laughs> we're all familiar with the Canada goose and its uh, love of eating grass on golf courses, on lawns, on uh, playing fields, that kind of thing. They're, our coastal area is going to bring in our shorebirds. If we see a bird in the woods uh, and we are open up to our shorebirds in our guidebook, uh, we're probably not looking at, oh, or we could be looking at a, a shorebird that sometimes frequents the woods and that would be like a snipe or a woodcock. Um, but it's not gonna be uh, a black-bellied plover. So no, understanding where things live are really helpful as well. Wetland, we have, there's our great blue heron back and all of the herons and bitterns, that kind of thing that would be comfortable in the wetland. Our owls would be in the woodland among uh, other birds. And then our insectivores are, are birds that catch insects on the wing like our purple martin would be over uh, near the pond zones, uh, catching the, the insects that spend a lot of time there. Um, one of the reasons why birds find habitat or why they are attracted to different hab habitat, uh, one of the biggest engines for that is, is their young, where they're gonna raise their young. And this is uh, three osprey, uh, chicks on our a nest that's on our property at North River uh, and we were uh, doing checking them out weighing them they weren't ready to get banded they were too small for that uh, but we went back later and and uh, when they were uh, almost full size and, and banded them so that we could keep track of where they went and uh, when they came back etc uh, but these, these folks, these folks, <laughs> these birds um, get fed by their parents uh, until they learn to hunt on their own. Uh, if they don't get eaten by a great horned owl, which uh, likes to eat osprey chicks, uh, they find their way to wintering grounds without the aid of their parents because their parents already left and uh, almost a month before they do. And, and so they'll winter over uh, in South America and in the Gulf and in the Caribbean um, for a year, at least a year and a half before migrating back to try starting a, a family uh, close to where they were raised. Um, and it takes a, a couple of years uh, in attempts at nest building. And after a few years, they will successfully build a nest and and uh, using sticks that they snap off of branches uh, and trees uh, before they, they raise their own chicks. All right, let's get to the vocalization of our unknown bird and let's hear its various Probably heard this noise. And that noise. And this noise. Yeah, so this, we're getting, we're narrowing down. It's pretty clear that this is some sort of woodpecker. Uh, and so here we go. We're gonna take a quick look at this uh, bird now that we have this photograph and see some of the, the um, things that make it special. So 
it, it is in the woodpecker family. And so therefore it does use its bill to uh, ex extricate uh, insects, both in the ground and in trees. And uh, they have an amazing uh, structure around their skull that encases their brain. It's like gelatinous material to help as act as a, uh, a shock absorber. They have a tongue that's so long that uh, it requires it to recoil all the way back and above the skull like this. And they use that tongue to uh, uh, get the insects out of the holes they make. They have four toes uh, that two point forward, two point backward, so they can grab onto trunks of trees. And you can see here, especially, look at these uh, tail feathers that are especially adapted. These are spiky tail feathers, almost like a, the, the spikes of a tree climber. So kind of fun adaptations. And we'll leave that one and go to uh, another slide. And this is, we're going to do a little test here. There's a good chance you're going to know some of these uh, birds are going to fly in. And so we're going to use three tools. Uh, we're we're going to recognize these birds as they fly in. We see that what habitat they live in, open fields. And so there's a probably pretty good chance that these birds are going to be feeding uh, prey in these open fields, like bulls and meadow uh, mice and, and that kind of thing. So they're going to be predators. And then we're also going to listen to, to the sounds they might make. And I, I'm pretty sure that most of us are going to know what these sounds are, with maybe a couple of tricky ones in here. But let's start by bringing in. This is our osprey that we're familiar with. It's, they wouldn't be around this time of year and the range, range maps would indicate that in the book. Um, they have some habits and uh, th they can hover, uh, which isn't unique to it. There's other rappers that do it, but it is an indication that it narrows the field down to what it is. This, uh, is the aptly named red-tailed hawk. You might have heard it in the movies when they have a bald eagle flying around. Uh, they, they often use the red-tailed hawk's call uh, instead of the bald eagle because the bald eagles is just not that as, as impressive as the red tail. Um, but red-tailed hawks you'll see around uh, a lot. There's uh, several at Daniel Webster right now uh, and one that's so, it, I won't say it's tame, but it's just not that frightened about people. And sometimes it'll sit on the roof of the entrance building. And this is the bald eagle. And we have, as you know, that we have several of them now in our community, uh, nesting in a couple of places along the North River, which is pretty cool. Next, we're going to bring in a bird that most of us know for sure and hear that call, sometimes too early in the morning for some of us. That's the American crow. Now, here's a tricky one. No, the next two are tricky. So, boy, that looks like a, an American crow, doesn't it? But it's not. It's a separate species. And we only know that because of the call is different. They look very, very similar. Uh, and this is a fish crow. So you might have seen these two crow species and just not known it. So listen for those differences. And if that blue jay sounds Similar to the red-tailed hawk, it's, it's by intention. Uh, blue jays will often mimic the sound of a hawk 
to scare other birds away from food sources. Now let's finish up with field marks. Uh, and, well, they will go to field marks and then rain, range maps. Uh, and we kind of covered them when we talked about uh, the really uh, unique adaptations of all woodpeckers. But yeah, this, this is um, a northern flicker. And what's kind of cool is that it, it, it's, they call the yellow shafted flicker because these under, under parts of their tail and their wings are very yellow. Uh, it's Western, um, well, it's not a cousin, it's, it's the same species. Uh, it's, it's Western brother or sister, if you will, uh, has a red shaft. And so it's the red shafted flicker, but they're both known as the Northern flicker. And yeah, they spend a lot of time on the ground because they, they eat ants. And there one, uh, one woodpecker that will uh, find man-made or human-made uh, structures uh, to, ra uh, to, to rap on because it's so loud. And that's what they're using to communicate. So this, this tells us where it uh, breeds, where it overwinters, uh, and where you can find it all year long. And being aware of the time here, I'm just gonna uh, speed things up a little bit. Uh, optics are something that uh, really help, obviously, in, in bird watching. It brings the birds close, uh, so you can really start to see those, those field marks uh, and the subtle differences in shape uh, and design. Uh, there, there's several avenues you can go down. Uh, I would recommend, um, don't, if you're, if you get interested, don't necessarily feel like you have to go out and get like the most expensive pair of binoculars because you will have sticker shock. Uh, the quality of binoculars have, has really gotten better over the years uh, and the prices actually come down comparatively for you can get a really good pair of binoculars for a lot less money than you used to, but you can still pay uh, a crazy amount of money. Uh, and so my advice to most uh, beginner birders is to find, don't ever look through an expensive pair of binoculars or you'll, uh, you'll wish you hadn't. <laughs> There's some really good ones out there uh, that, that are mid-priced that won't break the bank uh, and even if you find some, like you've got them kicking around, they're great. Take them out, use them, they'll help. And if you get really involved and really interested, then, then make the investment. Uh, but but don't, don't feel like you can't bird without uh, a really expensive pair of binoculars. And it's recommended, and in, in your head will spin if I started trying to explain uh, what the optics and all the numbers mean. Uh, but essentially, you're better off going to a, a website called uh, Red Start Birds, Birding, Red Start Birding, uh, where they will compare different binoculars. Uh, but you're looking at 8x42s eight, eight or 10x42s are, are recommended for, for birding. All around, a good all around uh, strength. And they'll bring it, they'll bring those birds right into you. All right, so let's look at uh, a familiar place. This is the uh, Rexham Beach and uh, the Atlantic Ocean, obviously, to the left and the South River to the right. And one of the things that really helps when you're birding is to know where to look for species. And so we're going to do a real quick uh, overview of what you might find here. Uh, starting with northern gannet, which is a, 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 what we call, consider a seabird or an alcid, uh, and it's, it's going to be offshore, uh, and you'll see them mostly this time of year. They're a diving bird. They spend a lot of their time on the wing. Uh, they're pretty distinctive. Um, we're going to have a, a, a number of sea ducks, mostly in the winter. Uh, these will be things like eider and scoter. 
uh, that will sp spend the winters here because the salt water doesn't freeze necessarily. We'll also get our gulls, um, herring gulls, black back, great black back gulls are two predominant species right now in the winter. We're not going to see our shorebirds in any numbers uh, until the spring as they migrate through. However, you, there are purple sandpipers out there this time of year. Uh, we have been seeing sanderlings in Dunlin on occasion in, in large numbers uh, that haven't moved further south than they usually do. Some of them will stick around if, as long as there's a food available. We get over to the, uh, so we're looking south here, so into uh, Rexham. So essentially we're in Hummerock looking looking south and that's the parking lot. And so we're gonna find uh, crows, uh, blue jays in the scrub like this. We're gonna see those, our, our uh, swallows again, working the, the insects of the beach. We'll find owls in the cedars at Rexham. Our freshwater ducks will be in the river uh, unless it's frozen over and then they'll go into the bay or uh, reluctantly out, out into the ocean. We have our waders, northern harrier working the, the beach, sparrows, salt, salt marsh sparrow. We've got a, a, a wren, marsh wren, and of course the osprey. And I can see that we're getting really close to the end here time-wise. So I'm going to uh, really uh, jump through these. So here's, uh, if you're looking for shorebirds in the spring and the fall, this is the best time in, uh, of the tide cycle to look for them. It's either the tide is coming up uh, or they will be roosting along the, uh, the high tide uh, where they'll come in close so that you can see them better. Uh, and then they'll be moving back out and feeding uh, at, at the uh, turn of the tide. So basically you wanna, on either side of the high tide line, you wanna, uh, the high tide cycle, you wanna, you wanna be there to look for shorebirds. Uh, you can also know where to look for particular species depending on uh, the, competitiveness of, of some of the feeding areas. And uh, this is a pretty famous study. Uh, there's, here's three woodland uh, warblers that will feed if they are found together in the same area, will we'll kind of partition, will kind of like uh, all quietly concentrate their, their hunting in, uh, in particular spots to, to eliminate competition. All right, and now we're coming down to the end here. So here's uh, important resources. These are the apps. Uh, I came into the digital world kicking and screaming, but now that I'm here, I've never looked back. These are really uh, great tools. Uh, they often, um, you already have them available if you have a phone. Uh, the the uh, Cornell Lab, has a, a, an amazing website and, and includes a uh, application called Merlin that's free to download that will help you identify species. Uh, and they have tutorials that, that will do a great job in getting you familiar with that. eBird is, a, is an app that will tell you what birds, what people are sighting and where in an area and that it's a great uh, tool to know where, what birds are where. Uh, and then, um, yeah, check our, check Mass Audubon's website out. We, we have quite a few uh, online sources as well. Get out there and bird with other people uh, and check out Wild Birds Unlimited. If you're not familiar with them, they're out, in, they're on, uh, in Hanover on 139 and and they are great, uh, great resource. Both uh, Pam and Steve, the owners, they'll tell you where birds are. Uh, they have lists of when the hummingbirds are, where they've been seen on their migration north. Uh, so it's a uh, good, good spot. Uh, go out with 
with groups, join a club. Um, pretty amazing. Um, for the most part, birders, although we have this reputation of being um, perhaps a little um, hmm, Well, sometimes just uh, we're birders for a reason, I and mean, it's not always that we don't like people, uh, but <laughs> but there's uh, a, a great community of birders out there uh, that are anxious uh, and patient to share what they know and to uh, and to enjoy you seeing birds for the first time and identifying birds for the first time. So, things to take with you when you go. Pretty obvious. Um, it, it's it's fun to be able to take uh, notes, so do take a note a note bag, a pad, and a pencil, uh, and then don't forget all of the things that are, are logical to bring with you if you're going to leave your car or house for any length of time. Um, yeah. And then when you're out there, just think about how important it is to, to respect the birds that you're, uh, they're, they're feeding, they're nesting, they're, they're creating territories, they're defending territories. Uh, if you're getting too close and you see signs of stress, then the best thing to do is to back off. If you see a, a really rare bird somewhere, um, be, be cautious not to advertise where it is, it, it could, uh, it, it could really disturb, uh, numbers of people could disturb it. Um, yeah. And then conservation concerns, uh, that we're probably all aware of is, you know, the more developing we do, the, the less breeding habitats there are, uh, loss of wintering habitats, uh, climate change is huge. Uh, you'll see in the state of the birds, these are great resources. If you go online on our website, uh, you can see the information in the state of the birds. Every four years, we do a, an inventory of birds that are in decline uh, and, and make predictions as to, you know, where numbers will be in the future. These are uh, bobble links here, uh, and they are uh, very few places where they can uh, nest. And again, Daniel Webster is an amazing place because it's 600 acres of grassland that you just don't see or find uh, on the east coast of Massachusetts in, in any number. So really important to, to, uh, to maintain these places. All right, so this week's challenge uh, is to go birding. Uh, so we encourage you to visit a local spot and closely observe particular things. Uh, what's the bird doing to find food? What is it eating? Uh, if you have, uh, we're going to show you for, for those, those that want to stay a little later, I have a short video on in sketching birds. Uh, and so please sketch a bird or take a photo. Uh, that you've, that's new to you and that you've just identified uh, or make a list of all the birds you saw on an hour walk in your neighborhood. And if you could send it to me by email, uh, that would be lovely. And there's the email address. Um, and I really appreciate your time and attention tonight. And those will, uh, just a short Come on back next week uh, for, well, for the rest of the time, but in two weeks, I'm going to do another uh, program on owls. So I'm going to stop sharing and hand it, hand it back. Yeah, Doug, that was a, uh, that was a great presentation. Um, I always uh, uh, learn something new every time, especially going out and uh, uh, seeing birds. You know, it's it's always a lot of fun, and I'm uh, that's you know, uh, of course, I can't help but bring up a little bit about the North South River watershed history, and that it was because of the um, someone who was out on the salt marsh not hearing the salt marsh sparrow um, anymore. 
uh, which was uh, Jean Foley, the, the person who then founded the North South River Watershed Association because she was no longer hearing birds that she used to hear. Very similar to Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Uh, so 51 years ago, this all started because of birds uh, and, and why um, the, the orchestra here. So, um, so really cool that you brought that up. And I also just love to bring up a point that with the North Flicker, uh, I lived in Alabama for a number of years and their state bird is the Northern Flicker. Of course, they don't call it the Northern Flicker. They call it the Yellowhammer because you're not going to call a southern state bird, uh, <laughs> and it's not, it's not going to have the word northern in it. That's for sure. So, uh, so a little interesting tidbit about that. So, so thanks very much, Doug. I really appreciate it. Um, everyone will be sent an email with uh, the uh, challenge for the week, as well as the link to uh, these two bird watching guided walks. Uh, uh, Doug and Chris Jacobs will be doing one Sunday morning. Uh, 8 30 and then Doug and myself will be doing one Sunday afternoon um, at three o'clock so space is very limited these these groups are going to be kept very small um, for safety reasons and uh, and so first come first serve and so I in just a few minutes we'll be sending out the email with these links to register if you are interested we'd happy be happy to have you uh, so come to one come to both if you would like I was just gonna, um, I'm sure I have a couple of questions that came in via email and just seeing if there are any other questions out there. Um, you can type your question in the chat box and Brian and I will read them off to Doug. Um, but I do have two questions that came in via email. The first one, do you have a favorite brand of binoculars, Doug, for a beginning birder? Oh, um... Swift makes makes a, a pretty good binocular. And, and you know, the other thing is, uh, so it, binoculars and optics are very similar to camera equipment in that some folks that get into it will quickly uh, want to advance their gear. Uh, and so you, you can find really good used uh, binoculars and I would go I would go that route if you're especially if you're looking for something uh, that is you know higher quality there's no sense uh, buying a brand new pair of binoculars if if uh, if used ones are, are workable uh, but yeah there's there's several out there I would go to that red start birding uh, and uh, start comparing. Um, I, I had Cabela's for many, many years. Uh, they're rugged. Um, but you know, there's a lot of folks that will that are willing to spend two twenty five hundred dollars for a pair of binoculars. I, I, that's out of my league. Uh, so I'm happy with like a four or five hundred dollar pair. And that's that's a lot of money as well. But you can get things less expensive than that and you'd be satisfied for sure. Awesome, thanks. And the next question that came in is about snowy owls um, being bothered by bird watchers and photographers. It's an, you know, kind of an ethics questions and just kind of more of your thought and your comment on um, are their daily schedules um, being interfered um, due that, to this yeah, that's a behavior? That's a Wonderful point. Uh, anytime there's a rare bird around, um, the one question I ask myself uh, is, is the bird any better off uh, with me seeing it? And the answer is always no. <laughs> so uh, you, you got to take your ego out of these situations a lot. Um, however, there are ways you can, you can uh, see snowy owls respectfully without uh, disturbing them uh, or stressing them. Uh, birds will tell you when they're stressed. They, it, you can tell. They, they are jittery. They move around a lot. They look a lot. Uh, they, they look back and forth. But yes, yeah, snowy owls, and particularly this year at Duxbury Beach, has been uh, problematic. There's been too many people trying to get too close. Having said that, uh, the word has gotten out and they're cracking down. And if you drive out there without a permit, uh, you are likely to get a $500 fine, um, which 
you know, will will deter anybody. <laughs> That's a good pair of binoculars. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I was out at Duxbury Beach a couple of days ago and saw a snowy, and it was probably a hundred yards away, and that was fine. It's beautiful, you know. It, you got to see the bird, and now you couldn't get like a full full shot, you know, a, a photo of it, full framed photo, but that's okay. The uh, last, oh, sorry, go oh, ahead. I'm sorry, Chris. Um, so, I, Doug, a question is, how common are loons uh, to this area, and, and where could someone go to uh, to find them? They're very common. So, th in the winter, you're, there's two, two species of loon that you're likely to see. Uh, it, the common lo loon uh, is uh, a larger uh, bird, um, and the rednecked is, is slightly smaller and thinner build. You can see them right off any one of our shorelines from Boston Harbor all the way down to the Cape. Uh, they they, well, actually, another good place to see them is in the harbors. If you go to Situate Harbor or Green Harbor, um, you, you are likely to see them. They're a bird that, they're a large bird, uh, and they sit pretty low in the water, and they'll dive. They're a diving uh, duck. So you're, you're, you know, one minute you'll see them, and the next minute they're down. And it could be a while before they come back up again. Um, but yeah, if, if you set your mind to it, uh, you're guaranteed to see a loon this time of year on our coast. All right. Uh, it doesn't seem like there are any other questions right now, um, but you can always reach out to Doug at DougLowry at MassAudubon.org. And for those of you who want to stay on, um, he will be doing a, um, just showing a short video on uh, sketching birds, um, which I'm sure is fascinating. It's like uh, six minutes and, long. Oh, pretty short, yes. All right, and then uh, next week um, is we have um, Reading the Landscape, um, and that's with Louise Beaudry, Jonathan James Perry, and myself um, that will be talking um, doing this, this uh, next week's webinar. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you. Um, and then Doug, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to um, start um, sharing your Great, screen thanks. again. All right. Let me see if I can. Ah, uh, things are looking, uh-huh. How are we doing? Is that, uh, no, it's not yet. How about now? Yep, I, I, I gotcha, I see it. Great, okay. So uh, thanks for hanging on for those who, who wanna do this. So field sketching to me is, is, uh, is a lot of fun uh, because it, um, it really gets you to think about uh, bird physiology and what you're looking at. Uh, and it really kind of, in, in, makes your muscle memory uh, stronger, in my case anyway. If I, if I can sketch a bird, then uh, I'm gonna learn and remember a lot more than if I look in a guidebook. Um, and it's, it's also fun to be able to uh, use that uh, if, you, if you wanted to make a field journal, you can write down pertinent information. Um, and so here, let's, this is the, the bird that, you're about to see uh, sketched, and here we go. So here's a little uh, spiel about field sketching and kind of the benefits of field sketching as you learn birds, uh, how to identify them, 
and pick them out from uh, others. So let's uh, assume, let's pretend we're at the beach and we are looking at a bunch of shorebirds down near the uh, waterline. And uh, there's several species and uh, they're running around. They're a little hard to keep track of because they're so active. But uh, once in a while they'll stand still. And, and in this case, we've got one that uh, it's a little larger than the others, obviously, um, but it is uh, ripe for a quick old quick sketch. So with gesture drawing and, and, and field sketching, you really kind of want to make sure that you've got uh, a good start with proportions. They're, they're more important than any of the other details. Uh, so this particular bird is pretty chunky uh, compared to some of the other shorebirds. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and make a, a chunky shape here. And its head is fairly rounded and it comes down and joins the body, something like that. It's got a little bit of a throat there and, and the head comes around like this and the bill's about right in the middle of, if you were to draw a line through the center, uh, the bill's like that. And it's not a particularly long bill, but it's it, it's longer than some of the smaller uh, sandpipers that are running around. And so, yeah, I'm starting to get a feel for this. I, I'm not using ever using an eraser because that uh, doesn't. Uh, you, you're just making a, a a quick sketch. So the body gets a little elongated here, obviously with uh, with the wings involved, and uh, obviously this one's got the wing kind of folded in. And because of the nature of our uh, point of view here, we see the tail feathers sticking uh, beyond the flight feathers and, uh, of the bird. And then we're gonna put in uh, its legs and the legs have to be over the center of gravity of this bird. Or under. And so this one has particularly long legs with a, kind of a fairly large knee and it's got its toes forward like this. And then it, it happens to have this leg up a little bit kind of dragging, not dragging, but hold, holding it up. And the toes are hanging there like that. Um, this is probably a, a, more like that. And then uh, again, without getting into too much details because we, we get lost in the details if we're, if we're not careful. Uh, I'm going to put its eye somewhere there, which seems fairly accurate. And now we've got kind of the basic shape, and I'm not really worried more, more than that. Um, uh, I've got, this isn't quite right. Uh, this needs to come down. The, the, the feathers uh, are here. The delineation of the primary and secondary flight feathers uh, looks something like that. And so it's also important uh, as you're thinking about this is to get some color in here. Uh, things that are uh, obvious uh, field marks and color is certainly a huge part of that. So I'm gonna throw in, this is most, whoops, I've lost my gray. So I'm just gonna switch to a regular pencil. Um, so it's got a little bit of gray uh, but a, a white kind of white spot here and kind of white and mottled through the throat like this white continuing down here. And so I'm going to go ahead and, oh, you know, I'm going to go for the black and just go light on it for the gray. And so, yeah, it comes back like this. Uh, the tail feathers, of course, are dark because uh, in the shadow of the wing. Um, and then we're going to get a little bit more color in here. Uh, the, again, the, the, kind of the primary flight feathers are showing up more like that. Uh, get back to some color. The breast, uh, even though it transitions from white down like this has got a little bit of a gray tinge to it. So yeah, uniformly the uh, kind of this grayish brown 
flavor to this bird. And uh, one other uh, feature I think that might be helpful when we start looking at the guidebook is just a little bit of a very slight pinkish uh, base to the, to the bill. And as I say, the bill is more stout than, uh, than long. So I'm going to start making notes like that so that um, I don't forget some of the things. It's so easy to, uh, in the transition, to forget, uh, and I'm really trying to work on these proportions, um, to get uh, lost in the details and, and, and get mixed up with some of your observations. So try to keep them objective. Um, and so I'm going to go right stout bill, uh, gray legs, and kind of a uh, plain, plain gray here. Yeah. And I might um, also take note of kind of where it is and what it's doing. Uh, this one is standing fairly still, but it's at the water's edge. So here's the water's edge. A little bit of foam in the, in the water. And um, yeah, uh, so the, I know the tide's going out. So that's probably worth mentioning. And the location, if I were to be honest with you, is in my dining room. But let's pretend we're on the shore. Um, so what I'm doing with this sketch is trying to get an idea of proportions, um, shapes, relatively uh, the size rel relative to other birds on the beach. Uh, you could even um, get fancy. And if you think you have a fairly decent idea of how um, long the bird is, so you'd be measuring from the, the bill to the end of the, the tail, I'm going to guess this is like 14, 15 inches, somewhere on there. So now I take my field sketch and I bring in my field guide, and this is Sibley's, and I'm, I'm just cheating here because um, just for the sake, uh, the sake of expediency. Uh, so what, uh, what I'm observing here is a juvenile willet. And some of the things I know or why I'm pretty confident that that's what I'm looking at is I've got some reference in, in memory. And uh, one of the giveaways for willets is that they're, they're a little bigger, they're heavier than a yellow legs, which is a pretty common uh, shorebird that we see along our coast here oh, and, and other places as well. So that's, that's what sketching can do for you is to get an idea of kind of proportions and start to get you trained to look for particular uh, uh, things that, that'll help you identify birds in the field. Uh, don't, don't be afraid to try it. Uh, you don't have to be a Rembrandt, obviously I'm not, uh, to, to do it. Uh, and it can be a relatively simple uh, field kit, just some colored pencils and, and a pad of paper. Uh, some people will actually keep a, a journal, and I wish I had the discipline to do that because uh, the ones that I've seen are just a phenomenal. Um, but yeah, have, have fun with it.